15 years ago, the world, and most notably, the northern constants of Altaria, was miraculously saved by the legends known as the Northern Oath Brotherhood, a group of zealous individuals who rose up in the ranks of mercenary life in the region of Arkvus to put life and limb on the line for the sake of Arkvus and its people, all in the name of young Anselm. Many lives were lost in the process, and the annals of the knobs tell of the passing of several chapter masters in such a short amount of time, but that did not dismay these stalwart champions, nay, it steeled them for the battles to come, which eventually culminated in the destruction of the greatest evil and the peace of the realm. The remaining knobs, ten in total, finally satisfied that they had arrived at Anselm's vision of a better world, disbanded the legendary group and went their separate ways. Some continuing fighting in their own way, others finally retiring to a much quieter life, but not before an area of the northern mountains was claimed as the rightful burial ground. And with this, their story and battles became legend across all the lands, and legends of swords and glory do not die out so easily. The year is now 707 PI, and our story begins in the region of Caldara a much less agreeable region of Altaria than Arcus, but people eke out their living all the same. A man departs from a dockyard of Zula and takes the long walk to Tritonthest, a towering fortress city in the mumbling sands. But with a lack of work for an unknown sword wielder that has pulled up to their gate half-cocked, he decides best to pitch up camp for the seeable until he confirms what the best action would be to take to earn a living in this shithole of a region. And with that in mind, it's the right time of day to crack open the backup cask and look to the road ahead with reckless abandon. This is a tale of a man who has yet to realise his destiny, a man who will be forcibly pulled into the limelight and whose actions will have future consequences on many who come after him on this continent and the next, a man with the inherited blood of a hero but heart of someone who wishes to cut a life out on his own. This is the tale of Gurfy Gregg. This is a Battle Brothers story. This is Greg, or as his friends know him as, Girthy Greg. To which, friends, he has very little. Greg by nature is not much of a socialite, much preferring to keep off the roads where he can, and not stay in the company of other people for long, not because he can't converse or he's socially inept. He just doesn't like, nor trust the Farkers, something that has been subconsciously ingrained into his psyche since he was young and had to defend his mother whilst his father was gallivanting across the north with his mates. It was only eight winters at the time of his father's departure, but fortunately he taught him a few tricks in the years leading up to that before he was recruited. Luckily for Greg, his mother, and Greg's younger sister, his father was one of the very rare exceptions to return from battle several years later, but having to defend his family up to that point against banditry, robbers, rapists, and even a goblin once, long story, from such a young age changed the person to the core. And whilst deep down, Greg knows his father meant well by going, and it also helped that he returned with quite a hefty sum that set up the family for life. But alas, the damage was already done. He continued to receive heavy martial training from his father and the odd friend of his father's who showed up on their new farmlands from time to time, all the way up to the ripe age of 18, before he eventually enlisted in the local army to escape from his father's shadow. Five years would pass of constant battle and hardships, and two more would pass of drinking to forget the last five. It is at this point that we pick up on the life of Gurfy Gregg, 25 winters old, attempting to find his own life in a completely new land, away from his father, away from what could have been his destiny. But unbeknownst to Gregg, destiny is a hard bastard to shirk. Gathering his senses from lashing his brain to mush on the ale of the campfire for the night previous, Greg sets off on his way down the trodden path to the next settlement of Gronham Wall, a smaller fort belonging to the same house. There was a natural gate through the mountainous area that the fort had been grafted into. Unfortunately for Greg, any jobs worth taking were kept for the elite, ones that the house could see as dependable. Greg is a capable, yet very hungover and unknown swordsman was not going to get much luck here. 
With that, he quickly perused the markets and strode off, following the signs posted for the market town of Grafenshine. To his luck, upon arrival, the jobs compared to the previous towns were plentiful, and some may have well asked for a warm body to take it, never mind a well-trained soldier. Greg took a quick glance at what was at offer. Not bad. I'm not walking even more after I've just got here. A caravan full of people, fuck that. And with that, Greg decided best at the retrieval of a precious artifact stolen from the town. A contract with the least human interaction, at least with ones he'd have to converse with. With a quick swing by to the local tavern, and the contract stuffed in his armour, Greg was off to make his first coin in Caldara. As long as I have enough food and ale for now, he pondered, as he tracked down the miscreants in charge of thievery. Seven men huddled by a local wooded area, unsheath their weapons as Greg comes close. Let's get down to business, Greg utters as he slaps his helmet on and prepares for combat. In the dark of night, Greg begins his attack, not taking any time to put to use the lessons of the longsword that one of his father's friends drilled into him. A man with a loot stares at Greg as Greg effortlessly cuts down his fellow brigand. For it is soon time to punch out from life itself. The slingers continue to pelt their rocks into the utter blackness surrounding Greg, but to no avail. Greg had begun the reaping, and he didn't plan on stopping until he had destroyed them all. After decapitating the fifth man, he saw very little challenge in the overall fight and sidled round the final enemy with such ease that he had time to climb the adjacent hill and cut him down permanently. With Turm in tow, Greg heads on back to Grafenstein to hand off the goods and collect his well-earned pay. Not bad for removing seven useless heads from their seven useless bodies. Greg would then proceed to dump the valuables that he obtained from the bandits and decides to pocket the small, well-looked-after knife in case of close encounters. With busy work complete, Greg naturally goes to next some ale at the tavern, decides to grab the contract paper and package that needs to be taken to Kampstadt, and leaves the gate of Grafenstein down the southern road to the fishing settlement around the coast of Caldara. At least transporting this thing Pierce me travel, he considers as he walks the winding path. Upon pulling up to Kampstart, Greg has a quick gander at the current work in the settlement, and he is so disappointed in the job postings that he even skips his mandatory tavern trip and just pisses off elsewhere. Shoring up at the market settlement of Kronenkrug, after considering his life choices, an event that only truly occurs when Greg is fully sober, he finally finds a contract worth doing. Drive off some brigands from some shitty house. At least I won't have to talk to any of them. A sword could do that. He nods in agreement with himself as he wades over the small riverbank that separates Kronenkoog and the disheveled hovel on the small island downstream. While scouting ahead and understanding the lay of the land was never quite Greg's strong suit, he at least understood the advantages of waiting until nightfall to strike your enemy, especially when your enemy severely outnumbers you, regardless of their stature. Survival of the smartest, he thinks, smugly to himself as he tops up his mug with his portable ale keg. Is this really the only reason you keep the donkey around for, Greg? To transport your beer? With his feet now firmly planted in the enemy's camp, he quickly assesses the makeup of the brigand group and decides to employ some tactics. Although, to those of us with lesser battle experience, it would just look like Greg is running the hell away. The brigands continue to creep out of the darkness as a lone rock bounces off Greg's lamella plate. The brigands continue to give chase unknowingly to Greg's advantage, as he has been leading them to a better defensible position to start swinging. It's here where Greg firmly plants down and revs up the onslaught. Due to how easy it was to put down the first, Greg subconsciously becomes more lax around his enemies. Not expecting them to be able to dodge his sword techniques. This gives the brigand a rare opportunity to smash into Greg's head, minorly inconveniencing him for the time being. Another falls by the sword, only to be replaced by another challenger waiting in the wings. Greg's armor now feels much more battered than planned. This will be damn expensive to fix, he thinks. The third to be cut down is especially visceral, 
blood spraying so far, but it shocks two of his companions to turn tail on the whole fight and attempt to leave with their lives. But Greg takes no prisoners this day. With the slingers exhausted, Greg sees his chance to push the offensive, dispatching the idiot who tried it on and coming face to face with the annoying stick guy, everyone's least favourite. The stick obviously didn't help him, and he decidedly took it with him to the grave. Whilst a normal solo traveller may have left the slingers to flee instead of instigating further fighting, Greg was on a mission, and one of them in particular damaged his armour. All's fair in a fight, he concedes, as he removes the head from the assailant's body. Greg corners the final culprit before sending him swiftly to the other side. The loot was bearable, at least. With his new loot strapped to the donkey, it was time to return to Kronenkoog and get his armour on the mend. Dumping the majority of his findings off at the marketplace for a quick sell, Greg decided to incorporate the better Wolf Gamberson into his luck. At least, it wasn't torn to pieces like his old one. Another swing, some quick recovery, and Greg was barreling out the gates again back on his way to Gronenstein. Back for his second visit is unfortunately more disappointing than his first, with only a single contract of having to escort people down to the port of Zula for such a paltry sum. Greg instead decides to stock up on tools and is about to leave the town before deciding to sidle back in and pay the tavern a visit. He walks in, but for the first time finds himself unsure as to whether he should be focusing on travelling the road north instead of drinking his worries away. The stray fort instantly turns Greg back into the tavern, and in his hands graces a cold pint. An honest reward for honest work. As he necks his ale, he comes to notice that Grappenstein is currently holding public executions, something that is more common than people realise. Not wanting his pint to get spoiled by blood flying all over the shop, Greg decides to treat his mug as a takeaway cup and strolls out. Onwards to the north, he confirms to himself. At night, Greg reaches the swampy outpost settlement of Swarsbrook, and effectively takes the first contract he can just to get out from walking in the swamp. He narrowly avoids it by using the rocky crags which take him on his way to his next objective, killing even more brigands straight out of the work that Greg would prefer. Up there on the mountainous region near Swarsbrook, a small group of men had put together some very shoddy fortifications, some sticks, even stones throw, make it seem like this entire thing is very primitive. He starts cutting down the men that come to assault him, charging out of their gates with best intentions, but not knowing exactly who they're messing with. Rocks fly, but sometimes do not always hit who is intended. And as such, the brigands take it into account and decide to surround Greg. A sound idea if it wasn't for the fact that Greg prefers it this way. A stray shot from the archer pierces through the brigand next to Greg, inciting a bit of blood splatter. A quick preparation and a solid slash downwards puts some more brigands on the back foot in preparation for what they'll do next. A sling hawking over the next brigand narrowly misses Greg as it catches him on his head slightly. The brigand archers, with a lack of better judgement, decide to continue firing their arrows into the current combat. Great results for Greg as one of the brigands falls down flat, shot by his own friend. Greg utilises this time to his advantage and decidedly cuts down two more. Now the chase had begun, it was time to destroy them all. Unfortunately, the flail man does slip away ever so slightly, but it is in Greg's best intentions that he will chase them down. As to whether he'll catch them all may be another story, but he'll at least catch as many as possible. The duo archers responsible for the deaths of some of their own soldiers depart at the same time, catching Greg's attention and unfortunately letting the other escape with his life to be able to tell the tale of the swordsman who soloed their camp. Greg finally catches up to the first one, and with the advantage on his side, easily blocks and parries the pissy knife that this brigand has been holding out with. Greg thanks him for his service and decapitates him thoroughly. Surprisingly, the slinger actually makes a return instead of running away, something that Greg can at least respect to an extent. But it did give Greg the perfect opportunity to lock him down. Another knife comes out, and eventually another sword comes down. But that's not it. Just because the rest of the men are fleeing does not mean that Greg's work is done here. Now knowing that he might actually be able to catch the rest of them, Greg charges with all the energy in his body to catch the last archer. Final combatant, hesitant to jump into melee, tries to assault Greg a seamless trick before and slams him down thoroughly, grabbing the loot and finally descending from the mountainside once again, trying not to fall into the swamp. After all, 
Greg really hates swamps. But then again, can you really blame him? On his return to Swarsbrook, as always, he checks the contract board, something he's sort of got used to doing now, and finds a contract which relates to the discovery of a location not far to the west. Greg quickly sets out, or as quickly as he can, in this boggy, disgusting marsh. He comes across an old woman outside of the home of a nobleman. Weird place to have it in a swamp. She sizes him up as though she were looking into her own past. Amused, Greg asks her what it is she wants, and the lady smiles. What is it you think you're doing exactly? Wandering the lands as a hedge knight? Killing and slaying and farking the ladies now and again? Politely, Greg informs her that he is in fact not just some tournament hopper, but an actual bona fide sellsword. She shrugs and throws her hands to a nobleman's house. And what of it? They'll never accept you. You'll be a fighter. You're out here. Forever. You only go inside when they let you. This is not a world you can improve yourself in. You are what you are born as. Well, the world is what I make of it. And I'm not just any sellsword, I'm me. Goofy Greg. He leaves the nobleman's house, confused as to why any nobleman would actually park their house in a swamp, a very bizarre choice to say the least, and finally comes across the location they'd been looking for. Out of curiosity, he scouts out the area to see if it's something that he think he could take on by himself right now, and decides it's probably best to come back at a later date, thinking he can definitely destroy it, just now is not the right time, and it would also help if he's actually been paid to do it at the same time. Another trip to the tavern sent for Greg, and he's off again. Fortunately, knowing the mountains this time from coming up here for a previous contract, Greg remembers all the shortcuts he made on the way back down, making the mountains seem much less challenging, at least this time around. He continues his way up north through the Skull's Breath Mound in the hope of something a little more glorious. Reaching the small town of Burgau, he takes a contract to obtain the seal of the False King. But on his way there, not all is as it seems, as rustlings and howls are heard through the woods. Before Greg knows it, he's been pulled into combat with three mangy direwolves, all with the feral objective of tearing Greg a complete new one. Greg obviously takes offense to this and puts his guard up and prepares for combat, slicing through the first wolf with relative ease. As he puts down the first furry transgressor, it was time to go on the repost. Fortunately for Greg, direwolves do not understand the meaning of repost. It's not long before Greg finally takes out the remaining two, a relatively easy fight, but he thinks there could be more from this, as he takes out the knife that he managed to pocket from one of his first kills whilst he's been in this continent, and begins to skin them for their fur. Not a colossal failure, at least he got two. As his journey now continues to the tomb that he was told about, he thought it best to camp down for the rest of the night and recover from the wounds he had received from those dire wolves. And also, maybe knock his armor back into place a little bit. Where everything tipped off, it was time to take the fight to the undead. What greeted him, though, was something much worse in comparison. A vampire a creature of the night, a necros event, held the territory of this graveyard, but that did not dissuade our girthy Greg, as he slams down the sword into the necros event's wrinkly corpse skin. The necros event begins to feed on Greg's blood, before finally missing, and Greg slams down, through what felt like a body to begin with, but quickly turned to ash. Greg returns the favour and decapitates one of the soldiers, and then jumps in to try and take out the rest. A pike flails forward and thrusts through Greg almost, but Greg has had to defend himself against pole arms on several occasions, especially since it was his father's preferred weapon. A slight scratch to the head and the cheek as the pike slices through, but it gives Greg just enough time to slam him down permanently. He grabs the loot and then makes his way back to Burgau with swift speed so he does not get caught out by any further direwolves. A turning point, he believes, killing direwolves, hunting down vampires, and he thinks it's time to finally focus on the swordsman he can truly be. He's out here by himself after all, so he should take that to as much advantage as he can. As he returns to Burgau, he quickly sells the remaining armor pieces, but keeps the direwolf pelts, because he just weird feeling they just might need them. As he departs from Burgau, he continues the path slightly northeast onto the next settlement in the hope of better pay, better jobs, and better ale. What more could one ask for? As he arrives in Lyda's home, he gets exactly what he wants. First and foremost, obviously, is the ale, and then he looks to the jobs in the hope of something greater. Fortunately for Greg, or unfortunately for Greg, he finds something that might be the end of him. There is a creature haunting Lyda's home at night, 
and Greg has been tasked to purge it, depending on what it might be. Whilst killing time until night falls, the pub is full of drunken denizens sloshing about, cheering, singing, carousing with the womanfolk of either wench or wife or whore. A man with a lute dances and plays, and another with metal cymbals crashes overhead, while a fat man booms with songs of battle or love, and whether a tale of victory or defeat, they provoke rounds of ale and more merriment all the same. Greg decides to leave the pub and enter the next building over. The wind whistles down a pew-filled nave as you stand at the door. A man, sweeping the stone floor, looks up for a time and continues with his work. Another man cheerfully crosses the room and asks if Greg would like to pray. Greg declines, and he purses his lips and crosses his arms. The crowd next door roars with drunken delight, as though to make a mockery of them both, and then he moves on. You stay for a moment longer, and then leave and go back out to the town centre, and squat on a series of steps. It seems there used to be a statue at the top of these steps, but vandals and raiders alike have made short work of another's artisanry. Greg falls asleep there at the foot of impermanence. Eventually waking from a nap, he finds a young man at the bottom of the steps. He says he knows he's a knight, and he's come to offer his services as a squire to Gurfy Greg. With a killer hangover, Greg eventually responds, Have you killed anyone? The man shakes his head no. Ain't never killed no one, sir. Well, what can you do? The man stands up straight. I know how to sharpen steel and mend leather. I can disassemble and reassemble heavy and light armors both, no matter how complex or simple, and I can do it fast, if we have a horse. Greg interrupts. I walk. Shifting uneasily on his feet, the man continues. Alright, well, I can cook. I can cook a fine meal, whether I got the ingredients or not. I make do. And, and that's, and that's about it. But I'm willing to learn. Greg, partially regretting how much he ended up drinking the night before, and not truly understanding where he's sitting right now, is usually a man of solidarity, and does not get on well with the local populace, as we have seen time and time again. But something twigged. In Greg, something that he's been thinking about since he almost didn't go into that tavern. Back down in Gronenshine, the 90% of Greg's brain, which is probably complete mush right now from the hangover that is screaming, no, gives way to the small 10% of his brain, which finally says, yes, let's see what this man can do. Very well then, Atirki has me squire. You ask the man his name, he swallows nervously. Sigrid, sir. You nod. Well, all right then. I'll take you with me. He smiles. That's... That's it? You nod. Yeah, that's it. Sigrid looks around. Well, alright. What now? You lean back against the stone steps. You follow me. Right now I'm gonna take another nap. If you're still around when I wake up, well, then you've passed your first test. Defeating boredom. The squire is grinning ear to ear. He's still there when you wake. Well, that's a good thing, because now I need a drink. And so the new duo head to the tavern and have their first celebratory beer together. Although Greg doesn't quite see it that way, just yet. But already, the wheels of destiny have begun to turn. Deciding where Seagrick would stand in the battle line would be up to the man in charge himself. That's you, Greg. As a man untested and also completely not ready for the battlefield as of yet, lacking both armor and weapons, and the resolve ploy to survive even one fight, Greg decides it is not time yet for him to enter the battle. He sends Sigrik on his first errand to go and pick up some tools and supplies for the camp, and while Sigrik is busy doing that, Greg slinks off to at least buy some gear for his new squire, although to this point he still has not called him his squire, just another person who is now travelling with him, which would be more of a pain to Greg if that man just decided to croak. Upon returning to the camp with the tools and supplies that Sigrid had collected, Gurfy Greg hands over the armor that he has bought on the marketplace and tasks Sigrid with his second task of mending his own armor, as it wasn't exactly in fit condition after Greg had bought it. Additionally, he requested him to also mend Greg's armor whilst Greg tends to his own wounds. This would take up the rest of the day and then some. As time passes, Greg feels like he should be remembering something, but doesn't quite get to the stage of revelation until it is almost too late. Night falls, and the creatures come. To Greg's surprise, he's suddenly surrounded by three creatures of unknown origin. Upon slamming down on the first, it disappears, only for another to appear behind him in quick succession. All of a sudden, Greg's sight is gone. 
and he is in a deep sleep, only to be ripped out of it once again by the same creature, pain rushing through Greg's body. The feeling of sleep almost overcomes Greg once more from a different creature, but to no avail. Greg, without taking a second thought, goes to slam down the one that he hit earlier, or at least the one he thought he hit earlier, putting an end to its life. Greg's eyes forcibly close once more, as more pain gushes through his body, not knowing where the pain actually resides. His brain, his body, his heart. He only knew that he must survive this fight, and to survive it, he must overcome these wicked beings. Another attack, and more of Greg's life ebbs away from him as he awakes. As he awakes for what might be the last time, Greg knows that he must act now, or he may never act again. With what could be his final thrust, he goes to the neck and decapitates the beast once and for all. He stumbles away, picking from the carcasses of the weird beasts, and takes the money from the man who originally posted the contract. Greg gets back to the camp, where Sig is cooking the food and repairing the gear before Greg collapses, Sig tending to his wounds, one of the biggest jobs he's had to do so far. On the next day, Greg awakens, mostly, or at least partially, recovered, and decided it was time to leave Lida's home. There was no more work to be done here, and he needed to walk off all the injuries he took the night before. Sig originally told him that it might not be best to actually set off just yet, but Greg, in his fashion, ignored that completely and left. Sig quickly following him. They took one of the back routes to get to the market town of Finterstadt, just slightly maneuvering around the Elder Woods, not to go too deep into the distant trees. But who knows what is stumbling within the Elder Woods? Maybe the trees themselves would put up a fight. Something that Greg would actually rather avoid right now whilst he's still licking his wounds against those nightmare creatures. With only disappointments awaiting them at Finterstadt. Greg and Sig quickly make their way north to the great fortress city of Tanghorg, although their names aren't that well known yet, so they don't expect to get work there either, but they can at least pass through for supplies on the way further north. The plan was to give Greg enough time to recover and reach the settlement of Ogna, in the hopes of more work to come down the line. Although against the same creatures? Preferably not. Many days will pass now, as Greg and Sig will patrol the roads between Ogner and Finterstart. Greg would come across a group of Naxeras and behead, behead, and yes, behead some more. Although the bits and pieces that he collected from both Naxeras and Alps would prove more useful as they visited the taxidermist back down in Finterstart as they got back down south of the roads. Greg tosses the questionable looking amulet to Sig and tells him they will bring him good luck in future battles, not they'll actually know this. With that complete, they both make their way to the marketplace in hopes of restocking their dwindling supplies, mainly in tools more than anything, and a little bit of food here and there. While Sig is picking up all the food and tools that Greg has bought, Greg decides to see what is on offer in terms of weapons that he could finally help outfit Sig with. His first thoughts go to that of a sturdy shield. A good start for any new combatant to the field. But as to what weapon Sig should start with, that was the point that Greg was stumped. Greg is a man who learned many weapons all at the same time in his youth, so just to start with one is a very confusing concept to someone like Greg. And whilst they have trained together slightly so far, Greg is unsure of Sig's innate capabilities and talents. Greg decides the best bet is to pick an all-rounder weapon that even a peasant could use to begin with. Easy to learn, hard to master, as he grabs a spear from the marketplace. He tosses the spear and shield to Sig. Now the real training begins. What felt like a lifetime would pass for Sig. Days would turn to nights, and nights would turn to days, as the endless training continues. They clash and clash and clash once more, even though Greg is only using a training sword to ensure that he does not wound young Sig. He does not hold back in the power in his arms and swing. Sig at first stumbling with his new weapon of spear and shield combo, but through the days of endless tormenting training, he finally starts to get the hang of it, picking it up much faster than Greg predicted. Deciding that Sig had got to a level that he could at least be trusted with his spear and shield on the battlefield, Greg takes him for a semi-celebratory beer before taking a quite easy contract just to transport something back to the swampy town of Swarsbrook. Evading a large group of goblins, something that Greg believes is a little bit out of Sig's expertise for the time being, but keeping too much an eye on the goblins leaves a bit of a blind spot. A group of brigands are waiting for any poor passerby to come across to steal their loot. Assault both Greg and Sig, 
this will be a time that Sig finally gets to prove himself. Quickly following Greg, both Sig and Greg climb a fortuitously placed hill between themselves and the robbers. As arrows and rocks fly overhead, Greg keeps a weather eye on Sig's resolve. If Sig turns tail and flees now, then this will be the end of his very short career. But Sig does not run, nay, he blocks the oncoming ranged assault and prepares for the melee attack. Sig has the unfortunate opportunity to put it to rest, marking the first kill in his journey to be a squire, in his eyes at least. As Greg lazily dodges all of the range attacks thrown towards him, now used to what these bandit rabble are truly like, he quickly dispatches the first and slowly makes his way down the hill, signalling Sig to follow right behind him and go and take the fight to the bandits themselves. As more arrows fly towards Sig, he continues to prove himself as a good shield hand, all those hours of training proving useful after all. With the constant misses from the arrows and the rocks, barely even grazing neither Greg or Sig himself, or Sig actually deflecting them off into the ground, Greg comes to the conclusion that this is actually probably a solid fight for Sig to do for his first ever fight, and just as he thinks that, he watches as Sig pounces into battle, chasing down the ranged slinger as they retreat over to their mates. It's just another day, Greg thinks, as he watches on, fronting the two basically naked men. Another rock deflected by Sig's shield, as the rangers decide it is now time to take him on in melee. Sig returns the favour, and levels his spear to the bandit, before piercing through his lungs with the blood of his previous enemy, ultimately also poisoning the bandit at the same time. A dagger slips through the cracks of Sig's defence, not fully matured yet, but it won't be enough to dismay the new ambitious squire. He lunges once more and thrusts the spear into the skull of the already injured brigand, his colleagues taken aback by the amount of power this young man had behind. Just a simple wooden stick with some metal attached to it. Two more thrusts and the next bandit is laid low. The final one attempts to flee, now realising that their ambush had been turned against them. You should never truly commit to an ambush if you aren't willing to go all the way. A lesson that that bandit will take all the way to his grave and beyond. With Greg and Sig now surviving their first combat together, Greg informs Sig to collect all their belongings, or as much as he can carry, to add to the cart before they leave. No stone unturned, and as simply as just breathing, the duo were back on the road to Swarsbrook. After all, being attacked on the road between settlements is just another day in the life of an adventurer. Another group in the distance. Unsure of what it could contain, Greg suggests they go off the road to avoid any further complications, as they go off into the woods to circle around them. They find it is just a group of peasants coming from Swarsbrook itself. Regardless, Greg would rather not just talk to these eight peasants. He's not really interested in socialising today. As morning breaks, as more peasants pass, and another, larger mercenary company takes hold of the road in front of Gurfy Greg, the journey to Swarsbrook becomes a lot more straightforward and a lot less bloody. Sighing as he can see the swamps in the distance, Greg confirms that they had finally arrived, and instructs Sig to go and drop off the package and collect the bounty. In the interim, Greg decides to go and visit the marketplace like he normally was. Always good to go and check out to see if there's more portable beer to take with them on the road, especially for Greg more than anything. He comes across a few interesting bits that you normally wouldn't see in a marketplace, some bizarre mushrooms, and a tabard which could prove quite useful. After all, the thicker your clothes, the harder it is to get stabbed. Plus, deep down, whilst Greg wouldn't admit it, he does like a certain aesthetic feel to his clothes. Upon meeting back up at Swarsbrook, Sig had unknowingly taken on a contract that Greg didn't originally agree to, but decides to go along with it, because at the end of the day, the money ain't bad, and all battle experience is good experience, both for himself and Sig at the same time. From what they could tell from the group that they assaulted, they could easily be from the same bandit brigade that attacked him on the road on the way here. This time, though, this bandit brigade was successful in stealing something from Swarsbrook, and one of the more well-known families of Swarsbrook wanted it back. As Greg opens up another hole in a man's neck, Sig dives in on the offensive, putting all of his energy into his first thrust, almost instantly killing the scythe-wielding man. The man attempts to retort, but Sig has been training well in his defensive footwork, and dodges quite easily. This gives Greg the time to finish off the one in front, and go and deal with the shovel-wielding aggressor. More rocks and arrows pelt into the area around Greg and Sig, but Sig now knows the force he needs to put into his shield arm to bounce them all backwards. The confusion gives him the opportunity to end the life of the scythe-wielding bandit. A slight slap from a shovel puts a scowl on Greg's face that can only be wiped off from retiring the bandits permanently. The archers and slingers now knowing their mistake for attacking two 
quite well experienced men at this point back away to try and utilize the elevation to their advantage. A solid plan if it wasn't for the fact that Sig was feeling so gung-ho at the time and catches one of them completely unawares. Greg quickly climbs the hill and is in lockstep with one of the slingers. Meanwhile, he hears Sig dispatch another foe. Looking over slightly over the hill to see what has happened, he takes his eyes very briefly off the man in front of him, which gives the man a very golden opportunity to add a quick stab and puncture. The slinger takes quick note of this small opening and lobs a rock right into Greg's face, discombobulating him for the time being, before landing one straight into his chest. The other slinger evidently doesn't get the memo. Seeing his master in danger, Sig charges up the hill without the energy to attack back. The bandit attempts to skewer Sig, but failing miserably as Sig's defense skills have improved greatly. With the slingers on retreat, Greg sees his chance to let Sig deal with the little stabby bastard and go and crush the slingers that damaged his armor. With the last slinger on the back foot and running down the mountain, Greg decides to cut it off at that point, knowing that there is very little point to chase down a basically naked man with a sling. With the bandits thoroughly whacked, Greg and Sig finally decide to, to return to the swampy town of Swarsbrook, arriving just as darkness descends. Not really somewhere that you want to be found when you can't even see your own feet. Upon the return to Swarsbrook, Sig is sent to the marketplace to sell all of the tools and weapons that were found. In the meantime, Greg decides to take on and check some more contracts, but currently, there's a bit of a drought in Swarsbrook, so they decide to camp for the evening. Over three weeks have now passed since Greg entered the fray of Kaldara, a man once set on keeping himself to himself now finds himself in the unlikely company of Sig, a wanderer not too unlike himself, and now he sees Greg as his mentor and master in all things battle and life. This does not particularly sit well with Greg. Whilst he did originally agree to it, he has on occasion considered setting off in the night, leaving a bit of coin and food for Sig to get by on before he finds someone better to call master. But Sig seems hard set on sticking around, and in the last two weeks has only grown into a warrior at rapid pace. Whilst Greg would never admit it to him, Sig's progress has been impressive, and Greg expects one day he may even surpass him. He at least has a few winters before he gets to Greg's age, and therefore could even become a true savant in his early 20s. Unfortunately, Greg knows all too well the sudden winds of change in battle, and all it would take is one strike to cut the possibility of that savant short. Sig notices Greg staring slightly. Time for the next round, Master Greg, he queries. Aye, Greg retorts. Mech ready. For this time, I will be going easy. You've proved your sand in battle now. Now we aim for even greater heights for your skills. Whether you like it or not, Sig grins ear to ear, and they clash once more into the night. On the next day, Greg and Sig march out from Swarsbrook, and no more work to be had there. Clocking the necrotic tomb that they had passed fairly recently, still seeing as not really a chance of two people to take on when there's about 40 undead shambling towards you. Undead in the runes included. Greg decides it's probably best to do a bit of a tactical retreat into the western forests, and as unexpected as always, a group of webnecks pop out from the forest in the darkness. With quickened reflexes, Sig jumps behind Greg, knowing that the onslaught of spiders is on the way. And whilst he knows deep down that he has improved in his combat prowess, nobody truly wants to die to four webnecks. And it was time for the lads to strike. A kill here and a maim there, and the boys suddenly become entangled by the web and gossamer. The webnecks attempting to bear down, or bear up even, onto Greg's girthy stature. Greg takes insult to this, as you would, and decides to decapitate the one that attempts to attack him, before hearing the winces of pain just slightly behind him from Sig. To ensure Sig's survival, he decides to turn tail and run. With the surprise webnecks crushed, the road to recovery had begun, especially for Sig at least. They utilize the times as they cross the mountains to camp in craggy outlooks to ensure that they were not followed by any more evil machinations that spawn from the forests. Fortunately, without much delay, the group arrive at the great fortress of Sattlefest and decide to stock up where they can. While Sig as usual goes to buy the supplies for the small group, Greg goes to check out the training hall to see if it would be any use for his current squire. But seeing that he's already done so much of a better job than these current layabouts are doing, they decide to leave it where it is. Back at the market, Sig knows a good deal when he sees one and requests Greg's approval to purchase a tattered, but possibly repairable tabard. Greg agrees to a questionable tabard purchase as long as they also buy better armor for Sig in general, knowing that the last time could have finally been the actual last time that Sig ever saw daylight. A small set of chainmail 
and a nasal helm is purchased to outfit Sig to defend himself against the woes of this world. Seeing a rare opportunity for his armor improvements overall, Greg also picks up a new shiny chainmail hood. With his noggin more protected than it ever has been before, or at least in this land, Greg decides to make one more purchase for Sig, knowing that it'll be a good beneficial investment down the line. Outside Sattlefest and inspired by the training camp that they had witnessed during their time in the Fortress City, Greg and Sig pitch up camp in the nearby forest just surrounding Sattlefest, preparing for their next group of battles together. Days and nights would pass as Greg and Sig clash blades and spears one and all. As many members of the public of Settlefest gather around from time to time to see where all the clashes of steel originate from, most of the public expecting a large army in training from the noises and clashes that are constantly echoing through the night, but no but instead find a larger than normal man and expecting and assumingly the man he's training. After three days, Greg decides to pop into the tavern of Sattlefest, take a quick swig, and then it's back on the road for Greg and Sig. A day's worth of work not to be found in these fortress walls of Sattlefest, only interested in ones that the nobles could really make some serious money out of. Unfortunately for Greg and Sig, they just weren't at that level yet. At least in renown, anyway. Greg knows he could easily take on some serious noble knights and probably still come out swinging. But let's maybe not listen to him until he's actually shown that he can do that. A group of bandits on the road try to dismay the adventures of Greg and Sig. Similarly not knowing the two people that they've just walked into are very experienced killers and well armoured to boot. But that does not seem to stop the onslaught from coming on, and one of them getting a lucky shot into Greg's head. With the first enemy laying low, Greg prepares his swordplay in front of these bare-chested brutes. Several sidle round, outpacing Greg in his massive armour. Sig cares not for this, as he awaits for his master to start culling the crowd. Poorly made wooden flail comes down and bounces off Greg's shoulder plates before he uses the momentum to bounce it back and cut the enemy in twain. Fear strikes him on the bandits as the slinger worryingly throws as many rocks into the crowd as possible, accidentally hitting their own men in the process. Sig thanks the slinger from afar and takes advantage of this by ending this man's career. Greg joins in and makes a gap through the current bloodshed and leaps into action towards the now cowardly bandits as they try to escape from the battlefield. Another falls, another runs, and a man with a hoe tries to take the life out of Sig. Rallies his spear up to shoulder length, pierces through the rabble. Greg, now knowing the power he needs to put into his sword to cut down this rabble, nonchalantly ends the life of two more. A scream echoes through the field as another life is taken. A naked man with a hacksaw managing to flee the hoe man, taking much of Sig's attention away from everyone else. And the rabble surrounding Sig takes his eye off him for a second, and that would be his last mistake. Both Greg and Sig nod at each other and separate across the battlefield, trying to chase down the remains of this bandit rabble that decided to attack them. Unfortunately, whilst one will flee into the darkness of the forest, another decides to come back to have another go, and Sig seizes the opportunity to lock him down. Two swift stabs, and the bandit is no more. Meanwhile, the bandit that Greg was chasing down made the awful mistake of trying to climb a hill to escape from Greg's reach. But what he's about to find out is Greg's reach is a lot girthier than the average man. Bandit unsheaths a knife from his pocket and tries to impale Greg, floundering around and missing. The Sig watches from afar as he expects Greg to lay the smack down. Fortunately for the bandit though, Greg is slightly offset by climbing up the hill this time around. Another dent in Greg's armor, something that will annoy him greatly. Fortunately for Greg, he managed to get his payback almost instantaneously. The man now knowing that his time on this plane will be very short-lived. He once again attempts to do as much damage to Greg as possible, before Greg then sends him to the afterlife. Sig grabs the loot as always, and the journey to the next town continues. They pass another mercenary group, fighting an unseen enemy in the darkness of the forest. As a local house company passes Greg and Sig, who... From Greg's perspective, would have been a hell of a lot more useful if they appeared all about 12 hours ago and doing their jobs by patrolling the region. And to double down on how useless the noble houses are perceived, not only by Greg, but probably by the rest of this continent, both Greg and Sig are a little bit bushwhacked by a group of barbarians on the road, only minutes away from where the noble house had just patrolled before. Greg sighs deeply and takes up position on an elevated area and tells Sig to push back in preparation. As the enemies swarm, Greg puts the first down as one gets around and goes into Sig's position instead. The barbarians, realizing 
but they have bitten off way more than they can chew. But thanks to Sig's training prowess over these last days, not even a thrall or a northern hound can deter him anymore. Sig's confidence elevates how Greg feels about this current battle, and he lays low two of these villainous barbarian scum. A head flying off into the bushes. Another two fall very uneloquently, showing these barbarian thralls don't even hold a candle to the girth of Greg and his mighty sword hand. Fools to slaughter, Greg thinks, as this is now starting to become a bit of a cakewalk before a thrall gets a lucky shot and kicks Greg all the way back down the hill into the clutches of his barbarian friends. Strikes are attempted against the group, but fail. Sig retorts, but also is caught off guard. The cleavers and clubs of the barbarians come crashing down on Sig and Greg, but naught find the edge, or even the pummeling that should hit Greg or Sig's armor and shield. They both bounce off or miss completely. Both Greg and Sig retaliate. Sig putting some extra holes in a thrall before Greg ends the career of an upcoming barbarian thrall with relative ease. Distracting the thrall that is dealing with Sig just enough for Sig to put another mouth hole in his face, causing the barbarian to scream and try to run away. With the dog downed and the hairy barbarian cleaved, it was now time to clean up the rest, as the screaming barbarian finally meets its silent end. As always, it's time for Sig to go and pick up all the pieces of the battlefield just so they can sell up as much as possible, but they find their bags are weighing a little too heavy after all the battles they're accidentally walking into in this settlement area. A dangerous place to be indeed, especially for two people. Sig and now his experienced management skills of dealing with the caravan discards the materials that will get the least amount of gold. With the barbarians vanquished, the group arrive at Nordholds, a small village on the edge of the tundra. Anything worth a damn is sold off quickly in the marketplace. As always, while Sig peruses and deals with the inventory management of the group, Greg goes to peruse the contracts, only to find nothing of any worth noting. They probably earned more from murdering those barbarians. As is the usual reason, the group departs on to the next, the better of contracts, the better of ale. Hopefully, a tavern will be found in the next settlement, as Greg is feeling mighty parched. Fortunately, the northern market settlement town of Norheim is but a stone throw away, almost a sibling rivalry between the cities, although they do belong and reside in the same noble house that wasn't always the case in the past. Greg and Sig rock up to the gates, and before we even notice it, a tavern off into the distance. Greg, quick on his feet for a man covered in armour, enters the tavern within seconds of arriving, and has the deepest gulp of ale you would ever see in a man see. You expected that he'd just come back to life, but no, he just hadn't had a beer in a few days. Unfortunately for the lads, the contracts up here are also very sparse, to be expected from a northern hold out in the middle of the wilderness. Upon checking the market for any backup food, Greg and Sig decide to devise their next steps and plans, with nothing better to do than wait out the eerie blackness in the northern wasteland. Greg and Sig continue to strive to perfect their training techniques, and begin sparring again late into the night in the early morning. The sparks igniting and alighting the snowy tundra in the peaks outside Norheim. The noise so endless and the flashes so bright. It is no surprise that some of the villagers thought the Aurora had returned. After many hours of endless training, Sig perches on the floor, exhausted but feeling more alive than he ever has. Greg kicks a stool upright and pours himself an ale, offering Sig the same. Sig grins, but declines. One of us needs to stay sober enough to pack up quick enough in the morning, Master. Greg eyes him as he necks his first drink of camp. I told you to stop calling me Master, and plus, I managed to saw out all the camp shite just by me send before you came barreling along, and how you manage up to this point, I'll never truly know. Sig chuckles as he begins his evening routine of sharpening both his spear and Greg's looming sword. But we should really look into getting you a new one of these. There's only so much upkeep I can do. When the fuck did you learn to talk back so casually, bastard? Greg retorts, but behind his ale-full mug, a wry smile creeps out, before reverting to his usual apathetic face. As for the sword point, I get you just sick. But we're not exactly shooting crowns out of our cocks, are we? We need more money, Greg sighs. Plus, 
You weren't exactly gallivanting around with the best equipment either. I could cleave and cut any fucker that comes our way for now. It's you we need better stuff for. Sick. Mulls over Greg's surprisingly good points. Well, let's agree to find a good middle road that benefits the both of us, then, Master. Sig nods in agreement. Hmm, hmm, with himself. Greg eyeballs him for a spell before reluctantly agreeing. Both in agreement of their objectives to gain as many crowns as possible to make sure the other doesn't die, they return from the wilderness surrounding Norheim and find a new contract has fallen at their feet. Nothing particularly new, but something both Greg and Sig can handle together. And with that, they follow the large footsteps looming out of Norheim in hopes to find the villains as soon as possible. After all, time is money, and money is what they need. Unexpectedly to both Greg and Sig, as they were getting to near the end of the tracks, the thieves decide to turn around and assault both Greg and Sig. Greg and Sig secure their helmets onto their heads and wade into battle once more. As a group of bandits approach, and a small hound began, begins to nip at Greg's feet, Greg can hear the off chuckling behind his back. Sig, for whatever reason, finds something relatively comical about this entire fight. Greg, however, has no idea what the fuck he's laughing about as he cuts down the dog and begins to move onto the bandit rabble. Sig nonchalantly strolls over to the bandit cause, trying to stifle his laughter before he lets out a booming confirmation. You rabble? Think you can take the likes of us? You've barely got a brain cell between you all. Come on, then. The intimidation and taunting. One attempts to assault Sig before he puts a hole in his leg. Another attempting to cut down Greg before Greg retorts and cuts him in twain. Another falls to the longsword, ever creaking at every life it takes. To the point that already Sig's words had become a reality. A lucky shot from the bandits, and they receive a small breath of respite before Greg makes them pay fully in blood. Greg goes to assault and puts an end to the slinger's life. Sig approaches the fleeing mob, still laughing as he misses wildly. Greg, while still in his own fight, is keeping an eye on Sig, noticing that his arrogance is getting the better of him. Fortunately, Sig manages to recover and put an end to the life of the one still in front of him, but now the chase is on to finish off the remaining bandits. Greg quick kills the slinger, not being able to savor the joy of destroying another slinger enemy, as he now needs to take chase to the remaining rabble. As they flee into the forest, Sig and Greg take chase, the bandit woman becoming exhausted and tripping over a snowfield as the shadow of girthy Greg approaches her, blocking out the sun with his looming sword. Not a second passes, and she's already paying a visit to Davcor himself. The other bandit, on the other hand, is long gone. Slip from Sig's fingers. Mistake that he will not want to repeat in front of Greg's presence again. Sig silently collects all the loot from the battlefield, pocketing it and collecting the stolen idol from the village. They'll return to the village and complete the contract, and then afterwards, they'll have a long conversation about what should have been a very simple battle, as the camp is laid out in a similar position to before the battle. Sig gets on with his usual routines, before he hears Greg pull up his stool and crack open his signature first flagon of ale behind him. Stop what you're doing, Sig, and sit. We need to iron something out. Sig, Expecting this to come after how he acted against the bandits, ceases his repairs and turns to face the man he sees as his mentor. Greg takes a long gulp of his ale and looks towards his knight in training. Now, I won't deny the prowess in battle has improved greatly since we met, lad. But, if you truly want to become this knight, or this idea of a knight you have in your head that you see me as, and you need to remember something important now. Never, and I mean this, never underestimate your enemy, regardless of their stature or how shit they might look. Greg continues his lecture. I have seen countless times throughout the years as power has gone into the heads of fools who fought them lord of battle, only to be dead in a run shite and piss the next day. Strive to be better, Sig. Do not let that power corrupt you. Swing with purpose and respect, and you'll strike true. Now stop being a cunt and have a drink. A shimmer of Greg's former self as a knight gleams through today as he attempts to steer his wayward charge down the right path. They'll drink all day and set off with a hope of work and crowns on the morrow. But what is over tomorrow's hill is any Farker's guess. To be continued.
Probably. Greg also starts another lecture about how you should also join the Northern Discord in the meantime, because it keeps you up to date with any rumblings in the North, as well as many episodes down the road. Failing that, Greg also feels like you should subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit the notification bell to ensure the next time Greg and Sig go on a grand adventure, you'll be the first to know, as well as any other series down the line. The next long form of Battle Brothers included. Greg and Sig say ciao for now.